21st Century Fox making another attempt to acquire what it doesn't already own of B Sky B then. The deal would give Fox control of a pay TV network spanning 22 million households. Bringing together Sky News with Mr. Murdoch's UK newspaper titles would give them much concentration of media power in fewer and fewer hands. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. Here are some of the stories we're covering this week. This is the most humble day of my life. It was never going to last. Rupert Murdoch parks the humility and gets back to growing his media empire in Britain. German news outlets give Facebook's fact-checking proposal the cold shoulder, at least for now. You don't hear much news from Chechnya. The government likes it that way. And please don't try this at home. The perils of the at-home webcam interview. Pardon me. Last week, Rupert Murdoch moved one step closer to getting a bigger piece of the media pie in Britain. He wants full control of Sky, the country's largest privately owned broadcaster, and has informed the European Commission of his plans to acquire, through 21st Century Fox, the 61% of Sky that he does not already own. But before this case is heard in Brussels, Murdoch faces hurdles in the UK. The decision is now in the hands of the cabinet minister responsible for media, Karen Bradley, who must decide this week whether or not she wants to rule on this case herself or pass it on to the UK's broadcasting regulator, Ofcom. And this is not the first time that Ofcom has seen this proposal. Back in 2011, Murdoch's buyout of Sky was all but assured until the phone hacking scandal broke at his newspapers. And feeling which way the political winds were blowing, the media mogul withdrew its offer. That was then, this is now, when Rupert Murdoch will tell you that he now has his house in order. He has shut down the worst offender, the disgraced tabloid, the news of the world, and booted out those rogue reporters. Plus, with the deluge of new news sites in today's digital environment, Murdoch would have you believe that media plurality in Britain is no longer a concern. The question is, do you believe him? And should Ofcom, if the case gets there, believe him? Our starting point this week is London. News stories tend to be about change. Ultimately, though, this one isn't. In the five-plus years since Rupert Murdoch first had this deal in his sights for full control of Britain's biggest subscription broadcaster, the country has new leadership taking it, after the Brexit vote, in a new direction. What hasn't changed? Murdoch's appetite for growth, his ambition. They are undiminished. This takeover really matters to the Murdoch media empire. And the reason it really matters is that this is unfinished business. Whenever you talk to people, you say, Rupert Murdoch's trying to buy Sky, and their reaction is often, doesn't he own it already? Well, he doesn't, and he wants to own all of it, because consolidation at the moment for media companies is the key word. Rupert Murdoch and Fox are already the biggest shareholder in Sky. They own 39%. But any increment in increasing Murdoch's power within the British framework for the British public um, should, be, should be looked at seriously. It's enormously significant uh, merger proposal, uh, both in terms of media ownership, media plurality, and all the kinds of issues to do with concentration of power that go along with that. And you have to consider the kinds of influence and power and, and crucially access that the Murdochs already have. The full takeover of Sky is something the Murdochs thought they had in the bag long ago. In 2010, the former government of David Cameron, which the Murdoch press supported, was prepared to let it happen and sent the deal to the regulators, Ofcom, to be approved. That was before the phone hacking scandal exploded, exposing the corrupt practices of an organization led by Murdoch's son, James, forcing the family to pull the proposal off the table temporarily, as it turns out. In 2011, they very nearly got there. I mean, they were really within inches of actually closing the deal. And then, out of nowhere, the hacking drama exploded and, you know, the, the world completely shifted. This is the most humble day of my life. And the argument now is we are a different organisation and they have divided the two companies up. So there is News Corporation with the newspapers and there is Sky and Fox, the television entertainment business. It's quite a difficult argument to make given the management of that company is James Murdoch. James Murdoch, once head of News Corporation, during the 2011 bid, what the Murdochs are arguing is that they should just be allowed to complete their unfinished business. 
Should the case be referred to Ofcom, the regulator is expected to study the impact the Sky takeover would have on media plurality in the UK. Murdoch's News Corp already has 40% of the newspaper market, and the Sky deal would give him more control on the television side. We tried repeatedly to interview someone from Sky or 21st Century Fox, but no one was made available. The news organizations would only speak to us on background, but they did send us this infographic, illustrating the way things have changed since 2010. The graphic traces the story from the original bid, without a mention of the phone hacking, the convictions, or the judicial inquiry that followed, to where it is today. The graphic makes the case that in 2017, given the evolution in the way news is consumed, via Facebook or Twitter for instance, there is greater plurality. But there's a big difference between a new means of distribution and a new news source. There is an assumption that people today are getting their news from an ever-widening range of news sources because they have access at the click of their fingers to an almost infinite horizon of news websites, broadcasters, press, etc. available on their phones any time that they wish. But if you actually look at the sources with, uh, from which people are getting their news, how much has really changed? Most of the news which people consume uh, in the UK are still coming from the same outlets as they were six years ago. So I think the debate on plurality will be really interesting and it's quite a difficult one for the regulator Ofcom to unpick. The Murdochs are not the only ones with unfinished business to attend to. There's also the Levison Inquiry, part two. The first judicial probe into the relationship between the press and the powers that be was limited in scope because there were so many legal cases still before the courts. David Cameron promised a second inquiry. When I set up this inquiry, I also said there would be a second part. A deeper investigation into the press and the police. However, the May government appears eager to avoid reconvening the inquiry, which would suit Rupert Murdoch just fine. Murdoch has the kind of access to number 10 Downing Street that other tycoons would kill for. In 2010, in David Cameron's first week in office, he met with Murdoch twice. On her first overseas trip as Prime Minister, Theresa May had just 36 hours in New York, but devoted some of that time to Murdoch. The Prime Minister's office says the sky bid was not discussed. It is not clear if part two of the Levison inquiry was. They tried to say that this was just sort of happenstance. She happened to be in the offices of the Wall Street Journal, which of course he also owns, um, and bumped into the proprietor. That slightly beggars belief, I think. You know, a woman with a 36-hour stopover in New York and a man with a global media uh, business don't just happen to bump into each other. The one thing that hasn't changed is what seems to be almost an unwritten part of the job description for Prime Ministers that they need to meet regularly with Rupert Murdoch, far more often, not only than any other media elites or executives, but anyone else full stop. You look at the major banks, um, you look at the huge oil companies and chemical companies, um, all of which have a huge impact on Britain's GDP, have a huge impact on jobs, they don't get anywhere near the kind of access that Murdoch gets. One final point on Levison Part 2. It is often reported that one of the reasons the inquiry is unlikely to happen is the government's preoccupation with Brexit, Britain's impending departure from the European Union, the idea that the Prime Minister does not want to antagonize the papers whose support she needs during the talks with Brussels. Lost in that logic is the contention held by many that without papers like Murdoch's clamoring for a yes vote, the referendum, which was close, could easily have gone the other way. So now, an inquiry into the relationship British newspapers have with the government and the police, which was promised, will probably be shelved because of another story those papers helped make happen. Unfinished business does get attended to in Britain, if not the government's, then Rupert Murdoch's, and sometimes their agendas coincide. Other media stories that are on our radar this week. It's been two months since Facebook announced its plan to work hand-in-hand -hand with German news outlets to combat the fake news phenomenon. But it's having difficulty finding partners.
Facebook has already launched a joint operation with the Berlin-based nonprofit media organization Korrektiv and wants news outlets to help spot false stories doing the rounds on Facebook and to offer corrections. However, German media giants like Axel Springer and Gruner Plus say the site is not providing the resources or the bodies for the job. Kerala Villa, the chairperson of the public broadcaster ARD, put it bluntly, we are not the correction unit for Facebook, she said. Germany's federal election is just six months away. The Merkel government says heavy fines will be imposed on social media platforms spreading fake news. Some German activists have taken the debunking job upon themselves. Hoaxmap launched last year. It details inaccurate stories published about refugees in Germany. Another site, Schmalbat, keeps an eye on the American alt-right site Breitbart, which says it has plans to launch in Europe later this year. Foreign journalists based in China tend to get more leeway to report than their Chinese counterparts, but there are limits, as a BBC News crew recently learned the hard way. Correspondent John Sudworth and his team were in the southern province of Hunan trying to interview a resident who wants the government's help to settle a land dispute. Their camera was rolling when they were met by a mob of civilians out to stop them. They say they were roughed up, had equipment confiscated, and were forced to delete some of the footage they shot. The interview never happened, and the BBC team said it was also stopped on the way out of town and forced to sign an apology come confession for trying to conduct an illegal interview. Politically, this is a sensitive time in China, with the convening last week of the National People's Congress, China's parliament, in Beijing. The Sisi government in Egypt is one of many governments employing American public relations firms to burnish their reputations overseas. And it turns out that the Egyptian General Intelligence Directorate also has PR firms working on its behalf. Weber Shandwick and Cassidy and & Associates, both of which operate out of Washington, were hired by the agency known as the Muhabarat. The $1.2 million contract is, according to documents filed in D.C., meant to improve Egypt's strategic partnership with the United States in the areas of media relations and social media strategy. The Muhabarat has been repeatedly accused by NGOs of being behind the jailing of thousands of Egyptian activists, as well as torture and the killing of Giulio Regeni, an Italian researcher found dead in Cairo last year. The Sisi government already employs the D.C.-based Glover Park Group, a firm loaded with Democratic loyalists who had good ties to the Obama administration. The Paris-based Media Watch organization Reporters Without Borders has called him a predator of press freedom. Comparing him to other human rights abusers, the U.S. NGO Freedom House has listed him among the worst of the worst. They're talking about the authoritarian leader of the Russian Republic of Chechnya, Ramzan Kadyrov. Kadyrov followed his father into the president's office and just last month celebrated his 10th year in power. The Kadyrov's political rise came after they abandoned the goal of Chechen independence, over which two brutal wars were fought in the 1990s, and made a deal with Moscow and Vladimir Putin. Since then, the capital Grozny has been rebuilt with some shiny new towers, but a free press no longer exists, and the few journalists still reporting on human rights in Chechnya do so at their own risk. At least two have paid for their work with their lives. Many more would-be critics have been forced to flee the country or have just disappeared. The Listening Post's Johanna Husnow on the challenges journalists face when reporting on Chechnya under Ramzan Kadyrov. Over the past two years, Chechens have witnessed a series of disturbing spectacles unfold on their state television channel, Grozny TV. Ordinary Chechens, accused of insulting the state and its leaders online, are made to apologize, live, on air, to the head of the Chechen Republic, Ramzan Gadirov. Everyone also knows the case of Adam Dikayev, the young man who dared to make jokes about government propaganda. He was made to apologize on camera in his underwear. In another case, a woman posted criticism against Kadyrov on social media. She and her husband were taken to the Grozny TV studio 
They were humiliated and had to ask Ramzan Kadyrov for forgiveness. These people are pressured to refute their words publicly, and undoubtedly this is aimed at terrifying the Chechen population. The shame and humiliation applies the sort of pressure that direct violence would. This is part of a campaign by Chechen authorities to ensure they are always depicted positively. You have to write about the authorities as you would about the departed, either good or nothing at all. Ramzan Gadirov has ruled Chechnya since 2007 and has succeeded in eliminating any space for dissent. Critical media have been silenced and the outlets that do still operate in the Republic all have to toe the government's line. The Internet is one of the few remaining places where Chechens can voice any dissatisfaction with the state. Internet access hasn't been completely shut off and social media is relatively accessible. Possibly because blocking Twitter and Instagram would deprive Kadyrov, who posts regularly on both sites. However, increasingly, even the Internet has been squeezed. And for Chechen audiences, there are precious few outlets or platforms for alternative narratives. The treatment of Kadyrov in the local media is very similar to the treatment of Putin in the Russian national media. If he says something, that is the news. За игрой пристально наблюдал главный болельщик, глава республики. And if he doesn't say something, well, there isn't much going on. Kadyrov is a very colourful man, and he does lots of things that journalists love. He hangs out with A-list Hollywood stars, and he has a pet tiger. Underneath that, in terms of actual day-to-day -day journalism, he's been catastrophic. The government is keen to present anyone who is critical of the government as an enemy. If you are a Chechen and you try to work as an independent journalist, you will be warned off. And if you continue, you will be hurt. And if you continue, you will be killed. The journalists who have remained in the Chechen Republic work as pro-government propagandists. If any independent observer watches TV or reads newspapers in the Chechen Republic, he will see similarities, not even to late communism, but to Stalin's times, when the only thing permitted was to praise, as though everything is perfect. We contacted numerous Chechen officials and news outlets to hear from them about the state of the news media and the Republic. No one responded to our interview requests. The last outpost of critical journalists has become Russia. The Moscow-based newspaper Novaya Gazeta and a site called Caucasian Knot are two of the few news outlets still reporting abuses in Chechnya. They do this work at considerable risk to themselves. Kadyrov continuously attacks critical Russian journalists via state media or through his social media accounts, and in some cases, it hasn't ended at just threats. In 2006, Novaya Gazeta's prominent Chechnya reporter, Anna Politkovskaya, was shot dead in her home in Moscow, reportedly on the orders of the Chechen authorities. Three years later, her colleague, Natalia Estomarova, who wrote extensively on Chechen human rights abuses, was kidnapped in the Republic's capital, Grozny, and murdered. And last year, a journalist working for Caucasian Knot, Zalovdi Geriev, was kidnapped, tortured, and forced to sign a confession on drug charges and sentenced to three years in a Chechen prison. It is very successful because for many who are living outside of the region, uh, especially in Russia. It is uh, clear taboo to uh, criticize or even talk publicly about um, Chechen realities. These are sensitive issues and many Russian journalists are practicing self-censorship when it's coming to the issues related to Chechnya. The current Chechen regime has a long history of liquidating its critics. So threats are not the worst that can happen. The regime has built a reputation that is willing to solve all problems with violence. While this is alarming, it's not completely effective. It doesn't stop all non-Chechen journalists from writing on Chechnya. We at Novaya Gazeta and colleagues at Caucasian Knot continue to cover abuses in Chechnya. And it makes the authorities there really angry, especially since we have a lot of journalistic credibility. The Kadyrov family owes its rise to power to a political decision taken by Ramzan Kadyrov's father, Ahmad Kadyrov. During the Second Chechen War in 1999, Kadyrov Sr. abandoned the separatist cause in exchange for a deal with the Russians. 
Ever since then, Moscow has propped up the Chechen state and the Kadyrovs have been keen to manage their media image, not just at home, but in Russia as well. There's an element of constantly reinforcing himself to a Russian audience. Most Russians, certainly Russian nationalists, don't like him. He is seen as, as, as receiving way too much money from the center. He is elevated, he's the hero of Russia, despite the fact that he previously fought against Russia. So by stressing his loyalty, he's saying, look, I, I'm on your side. I personally think it's, it's a bit of a, an act. Um, Kadyrov is, is loyal to Kadyrov. <laughs> This constant demonstration of loyalty to Putin is a way to ensure he can do whatever he wants in Chechnya. And what has Putin done? He has permitted Kadyrov to build up his military forces. The Chechen state suppresses separatist movement and consolidates Russian power in the Republic. Kadyrov is part of Moscow's Chechnya strategy. But what Putin didn't notice along the way is how de facto an independent regime came into existence. After two devastating wars and nearly 20 years of Kadyrov rule, Chechnya has rehabilitated itself somewhat. The capital Grozny is peppered with shiny new buildings, but the city's gleaming surface doesn't quite hide the political shambles the Republic is in. Ordinary Chechens have no political agency, the media climate is oppressive, and there's an ongoing insurgency carrying on the fight against the Russian state. Chechnya has hundreds of news stories going untold, and the leader of the Republic, Ramzan Gadyrov, is making sure it stays that way. On the download now, our viewers on the current state of journalism in Chechnya. There are large diasporas of Chechens living in Europe. These people, obviously, have much more freedom than uh, Chechens living in, at home in Chechnya. But nevertheless, they know that all they do is controlled by Kadyrov. Kadyrov himself stated this in his Instagram, and I quote him. I know all the Instagram or Facebook profiles you use. We have all your comments saved, and sooner or later, you'll answer for every one of your words. So the message is clear, and Chechens living abroad are not as afraid for their own lives as they are for the safety of the ones they left behind. There is very little English language reporting on human rights abuses in Chechnya. The main reason for it is lack of journalists on the ground. It's practically impossible for foreign journalists to produce meaningful reports in Chechnya due to heavy interference on behalf of Chechen and Russian authorities. Finally, you're seeing it more and more often, particularly on 24-hour news channels like this one. The at-home interview conducted through the interviewee's webcam. Producers love them. They spare cash-strapped news channels, the trouble of dispatching a crew, all that expensive gear, effectively creating news content for free. What could possibly go wrong? Well, when BBC World News interviewed an academic named Robert Kelly this past week about recent political developments in South Korea, his kids wanted to see what daddy was up to on his computer. Professor Kelly kept his cool and later tweeted the following, Is this the kind of thing that goes viral and gets weird? Tens of millions of hits in just a few hours is your answer. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Time, the question is how do democracies respond to those scandals? Uh, and what will it mean for, uh, for the wider region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift, shifting, shifting sands in the region, do you think relations with the North may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. <laughs> the, um, pardon me. Pardon me. My apologies. What is this going to be for the region? My apologies. North, uh, sorry. Um, North Korea, North, uh, South Korea's policy choices on North Korea have been severely limited in the last six months.